Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at what happens when you take the monoblock from the MSI Z690 Torpedo EKX Motherboard Plus Monoblock bundle and try to reuse that block on other non like other motherboards that it's obviously not meant for. Um, now it only fits LGA 1700 motherboards because the monoblock doesn't have like. The, the mounting hole spacing only lines up for LGA 1700, but that still covers a very large variety of motherboards, and unless Intel plans to make their mainstream socket significantly larger sometime soon, I think they're probably going to keep using this hole spacing for a while, um, as really the only reason to change hole spacing is if the socket is getting bigger, and I, like... I'm, I'm pretty sure there's still room for, like, a couple hundred more pins before they need to make the whole spacing even w larger than it is right now. Um, anyway, yeah, so I've slapped the monoblock onto a Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Pro DDR5 board. Um, and when I say slapped it, I mean that because it's literally just kind of there. Like, <laughs> those power stages, th those aren't making contact with the monoblock at all. Um... Yeah, this the the way basically the way the VRM b is being cooled right now is all of the heat generated by, by the power stages uh, sinks through the inductors into the monoblock. Uh, also through two layers of thermal pads. So I'm using the two millimeter pads that uh, come with the monoblock from EK, and then also some 1.5 millimeter pads uh, on top of that because the the gap between the monoblock and the inductors is really really big. So. Yeah, it takes quite a lot of thermal pad to, f like, bridge that gap. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so so that's kind of that. It's just, that's that's the VRM cooling right now in, in this setup is just... Um, we've got uh, exposed power stages and, you know, just kind of hoping that the all the heat... Like, the thermal transfer through the inductors and the two layers of thermal pads is good enough to keep the VRM from overheating while running a 12600KF at a, at like, well, at over 200 watts of power consumption. The issue is, I don't really trust this, like, the, the power readings on Intel motherboards don't tend to be very accurate, so this board is reporting that, like, well, let's just take a look at what it's been running. So yeah, it's been running Prime95 small FFTs, AVX2 for the last 2 hours and 51 minutes, so our average temperatures are 101 degrees, 85 degrees, 92 degrees, 101 degrees. Like, I'm getting the same CPU temperatures as on the MSI board, um, but with the power draw being reported, like, 30 watts lower. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's just a measuring problem, rather than, like, I don't think I mounted the block that badly. And I also don't think the VRM temperatures are causing the CPU to run hotter, because... Uh, I went around the back of the board with a infrared thermometer, and actually, like, the socket part of the motherboard, it, like, the so around the socket, the board's relatively cool. It's just, like, once you get to where the power stages are, it's hot, because, like, everything after the inductors is cool, everything before the inductors is hot, which is obviously the power stages. So, yeah, I have a sneaking suspicion that, like, this, like... Either this board is under-reporting power draw, or the MSI board was over-reporting power draw, but I'm not sure which. It, admittedly, the room is a bit warmer than when I was testing the MSI board. Um, the MSI, that was tested at like 19 degrees Celsius ambient. Right now we're at about 21 degrees Celsius ambient, so that's obviously not helping the cooling situation, but I still think the temperatures are a bit high for, like, I, I don't think... Um, two degrees of ambient air temperature would make a 30 watt difference in terms of what you can cool. That, that, that doesn't really make any sense. So I'm pretty sure this board is under-reporting the power consumption, uh, or the MSI board was over-reporting it. Uh, one of the two. I, I didn't bother to really check, because, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the other issue is, like, matching the voltage settings between different Intel motherboards is really, really difficult, because... There's no pro like there's no real standard for where your V core is supposed to be measured and so because it's just the super I/O voltage reading. So on the MSI board you have a voltage reading that's relatively close to the die, but it's not actual die sense. And on a gigabyte motherboard like this, you just straight up don't have die sense at all. This is a straight up so like socket reading, and so the voltage reading here is like way off from what the MSI motherboard is using, and so. Yeah, unfortunately, it, like, I can't match the voltage settings between the two boards or anything like that, so that's super frustrating. Um, 
And either way, the CPU's at 5 gigahertz on the P cores, uh, just under 4.2 gigahertz on the E cores, and just not like 4.16 on the E cores and 4.16 on the ring. Um, and yeah, and it's been just kind of running Prime 95 small FFTs for the last almost three hours now, and uh, we, we've got no real power stage cooling, right? <laughs> and yet, the uh, VRM temperatures are, like, they're not good, or, well, they're fine. Um, the VRM maxed out at 88 degrees Celsius, which is, like, the the issue here is this is a 12600 kf so obviously if we had a over like heavily overclocked 12900 k this would not be fine this would be well over 100 degrees if we were on a 12900 k at this point but this is like it's not completely terrible right like this isn't a disaster um and this is with no proper power stage cooling right like literally all the heat the power stages are generating has to either be dissipated by the PCB and, and the power stage itself, or it has to go through the inductor, through two layers of thermal pads, and then into the then finally into the mono block. So, yeah, um, considering how like inefficient this cooling setup is, um, honestly, the VRM temperatures aren't that bad. And also, this isn't really like a super high end motherboard. So. Um, if you used, like, I imagine if I used, like, a Gigabyte Z690 or a Smaster or a, um, yeah, if I used the Master, especially if I kept the backplate on the Master, I think the, the, the Master board would have probably actually done just fine, uh, even with a 12900K, because that board uses more power stages. I don't believe those power stages are any better. Technically, they have a nomin higher nominal current spec, like, the, the Master is on 105 amp power stages and the... The Pro is on 90s, but the the efficiency like from the the from the documentation I have, it looks like the efficiency curves for both power stages are identical. So I don't believe that the power stages themselves would make a difference. But the uh, master does have like three more power stages, so that's just more surface area for the heat to be dissipated across. Also, since we're using the inductors to actually transfer the heat from the VRM into the mono block, having three more inductors to do that with is beneficial. Um, and then also the master uses an eight layer PCB, not a six layer PCB, which significantly helps with actually dissipating heat in the motherboard itself. So, um, yeah, I think if you did this with a high-end motherboard, it might even be viable with a 12900K. Um, whereas here, you know, it's like, well, this is viable with, it's not borderline, right? Like borderline is if we were approaching 100 degrees Celsius. We're not doing that. We're at 90. Uh, we're under 90. So I don't really see, like, this isn't borderline in my opinion. But with a 12900K, it would I don't think it would even be borderline. I think it would be straight up, you know, well over 100 degrees Celsius, which wouldn't be, which would definitely, like, that would not be ideal. So, um, like, it wouldn't be completely unacceptable, but I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't, you know, recommend that you use the, the system in, in, with the mono block and a 12900K like this, because that, that just, long term, that's a bad idea. Um, uh, uh, where was I going with this? Yeah, so, like, surprisingly effective, um, even if you do this with, like, a, like, if you did this to a high-end motherboard, because the one, one of the ways I was thinking about this is, like, let's say you start your build with a torpedo board, and then someday you just decide that, hey, you want to upgrade to a better motherboard, because you get more into overclocking than you thought you would, or whatever, and so you decide to get a better motherboard, well, now you would potentially have to get a new water cool, like you'd have to potentially get a new CPU block. Um, but if you were upgrading to say a master, which I don't think really is an upgrade, like if you're upgrading, I'm gonna, I would recommend you get a one DIM per channel motherboard. So I'd be like a Unify X or something is what I would consider an upgrade. Um, and with a board like that, you could probably get a, like those are motherboards where you can almost get away with not having VRM heat sinks at all. So, on those boards, this would totally, like, I think this would be totally okay, <laughs> to some extent. So, yeah, anyway. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to uh, sort of mention with this is that, um, honestly, like, if EK just um, offered, like, a aluminum brick that goes between the power stages and the monoblock, right? Just to fill, like, just to, 
level off the the like basically just to match the height of the inductors um this could very like this style of monoblock could be very easily des like designed to basically be compatible with any motherboard right because like the thing is water cooling the vrm like or more like water cooling is so incredibly effective uh at removing heat from things and VRMs really don't produce a lot of heat, which is, like, why this is okay. Like, we're trying to water cool the VRM through the inductors, and it's still kind of working. Um, because, like, the water, like, water is so damn good at just pulling heat out of, well, the inductors. Um, and so, consequently, since the inductors are running very cool, um, they're actually, you know able to sink quite a lot of heat from the power stages, which normally if your inductors are at the same temperature as your power stages, there's not going to be any heat transfer at all because they're at the same damn temperature. Therefore, by definition, there's not going to be heat transfer. But anyway, so even with like really suboptimal thermal transfer, like this works. And so if there was just like, honestly, maybe even just having like a giant like, I don't know, like 10 millimeters of thermal pad or something between the power stages and the monoblock might even be viable. Because the thing is, air is really, really bad as a thermal, like, as a thermal transfer medium. So, yeah, but I think, like, I think the better way to do this would be just, like, an aluminum adapter bar, which would just be pre-drilled for a few different motherboard VRM hole space, like, hole, hole patterns, and then some, like, thicker thermal pads than what the torpedo board uses. Because the thing is, the torpedo comes with, like, VRM heat sinks that are very much designed to uh, sink heat into the monoblock. But I'm kind of thinking, like, th honestly, those heat sinks are unnecessarily complicated. We just need something to fill the gap between the power stages and the monoblock, and it'll be fine, because the freaking inductors are doing a decent job. Like, the inductors are doing a decent job. And inductors... Um, are a sintered, like, the the core and casing material for inductors is a sintered metal. Like, it is not meant to be super thermally conductive. Like, it would be beneficial for the inductor if it was, but because of the magnet, like, the magnetic properties that are desired for inductor cores and electrical properties that are desired of inductor cores, they're made of sintered metal, which isn't really, like, the best option for tr thermal transfer. Um, so yeah, just like an aluminum brick, like block that would go between the power stages and the, and the mono block. And then you'd have like two layers of thermal pads again, right? You'd have one thermal pad on the power stages, then you'd have your aluminum block. Then you'd have the second layer of thermal pad that actually connects it to, to the, uh, mono block. But like that would probably like that would, I would be very surprised if that didn't turn the VRM temperatures we're getting right now, which are like you know, eh, not that great, to totally acceptable. Um, so, yeah, um, I I think, like, I think that would be really cool if, if EK just sort of, like, because right now this monoblock is really designed to only work with the VRM heat sinks on the torpedo board, but I think it would be trivial to just have adapter plates that make this block work properly on every motherboard. Because it kind of works already, even on motherboards without any proper support, right? Like, I am hammering this 12600KF here, right? Like, it, if you wanted to, like, if you were just doing a daily gaming build, this would actually be totally viable. Like, for a gaming build, this would be non-issue, right? Like, if we run something... Because, like, Prime 95 is an insanely heavy workload. If we, if we stop Prime 95, right... And we just switch over to, say, Cinebench. Um, like, also, because there's no thermal mass on the VRM right now, the temperatures just fall off <laughs> fall off a cliff. So there's no VRM heat sinks to maintain the PCB temperature. Yeah, so the VR the temperatures immediately start dropping. Now let's start running Cinebench. I think the VRM temps are going to keep dropping as Cinebench runs. Yeah, because Cinebench doesn't pull anything. Pulls like 60 watts of heat less. Oh, actually, it managed to come back up a bit. Ah, uh, nope, it's still coming down. Yeah. It'll it'll probably keep coming down. Oh, wait, no, maybe it equalized at 80. Well, no, nah, I think it's going to start coming down. Yeah, because... 
Especially once, like, because the thing is, Cinebench, therm like, load cycles every time it restarts rendering the scene. So, yeah, I imagine if I kept this running, the VRM temperatures would actually come down to, like, 75 or something. Like, yeah, pro I'd, or, well, maybe not 75, but they, they would start coming down. So that's kind of the thing is, like, so, you know, um, yeah, that, like... With the monoblock as is, you can already kind of just use it on motherboards that it doesn't belong on. And if it just came with, like, adapter plates for different motherboards, which wouldn't have to be any, like, literally just a block of aluminum. That's, you know, f I, I think you can imagine exactly what I'm describing. Um, with just some holes in it so that you can bolt it to the board, like is perfect. Like, it would be the first... I, I think it would basically make this the first universal monoblock, because as far as I'm aware, all past monoblocks have always been, like, specific to one uh, motherboard and its VRM layout, whereas this is, like, you just need, like, basic adapter plates, and it'll fit anything. I mean, on high-end motherboards, it'll work as is, because on the high-end motherboards, the VRM heat sinks are more of an aesthetics thing than an actual you know, necessary component of the motherboard for long-term operation of the VRM. So, yeah, like, if you wanted to reuse this monoblock on, like, a, on an Apex or something, right, completely, you could totally do that. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, the main reason I decided to do this test with a Gigabyte Z690 AORUS Pro instead of one of the high-end motherboards is most of the high-end motherboards have relatively elaborate VRM heatsink designs that are a massive pain to disassemble. Um, yeah, so that's why I chose this motherboard, because this motherboard takes, like, four screws to get the VRM heatsinks off, whereas something like the Z690 AORUS Master is, like, you need to take off the backplate, um, which is a bunch of screws... And then I think you need to take off the I.O. cover when you take off the backplate. And then you can finally take off the VRM heat sinks. And that's way too many steps for a test like this, in my opinion. Because, uh, yeah, admittedly, we would have gotten better VRM temperature results. But the, the point is, like, this works way better than, like, I think a lot of people would, you know, assume it would. Now, I think on low-end motherboards, this probably wouldn't be a good idea. Um... I'm not sure how low-end you'd have to go before it really becomes a problem. Like, this VRM is still, in terms of components, it's still very good. Really, I think the biggest limiting factor on this uh, board's VRM temperatures is the 6-layer PCB more so than anything else. But, um, yeah, um, that's it for the video. It's just, like, um, the, the, like, EK, like, I hope to, like, I think EK should really consider making adapters for this monoblock so that you can just put this onto any motherboard because it almost already works. Like, it's almost there as is. And so just some really simple adapters would, would make this, like, yeah, which would be really cool. Because it's, you know... Because, the, the, like, one of my, my personal biggest issue with monoblocks has historically been that they're way too expensive and they only fit one motherboard. And this right here fixes that. And honestly, I think this approach could probably even work for GPUs, where you could have, like, a, a GPU block that doesn't directly make contact with any of the components on the GPU, and then it just uses adapter plates to, like, reach the actual, like, power stages, memory chips. Though on a GPU, it would be really awkward because most people want their GPU blocks to be relatively thin. And I think... Like, if you did a two-slot thick GPU block, that could totally work. But I think in a single-slot GPU block, yeah, you, you wouldn't have enough space for that. Um, but anyway, for motherboards, um, yeah, I, I think, like, this is this is basically a universal monoblock, as is. <laughs> and it's just, like, add adapter plates, and it, it, it is. Like, it's 100% there. So, yeah, that's it for the video. Uh, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, uh, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. Uh, both Patreon and Teespring help out immensely with running the channel, so it would be much appreciated if you check them out. And that's it for the video, so thank you for watching, and goodbye!